Welcome to the Your Audio Solutions Podcast, episode 10. We finally made it to the Big Ten, and it's awesome to have you here listening to this podcast. Um, today we have a great guest, um, Nicolas Di Lorenzo from Australia. Um, he's a mastering engineer, a mixing engineer, uh, based in Melbourne, Australia, where he operates out of his own studio, Panorama Mastering. Um, which he opened in 2014. It was a great conversation talking to Nicolas. He's a really smart guy. Uh, he has a lot of great knowledge about running your studio or business. Um, so I think you're going to love this episode. Um, we spoke about you know his, his beginnings playing in bands using Audacity, Guitar Pro, which is hilarious because me and my friends used to use Guitar Pro making awful songs, sending, sending them to each other. Um, so that's a, that's a funny program to use. I don't know if you used it, but yeah, it's hilarious. Um, what else? We, started about, we talked about how he got his internship in a mastering studio, uh, tips of what not to write in emails if you're writing to studios. Um, why he decided to start his own mastering studio, uh, the benefits of using your own name as a brand for your studio, um, why the first few years of him opening his studio was a delusional process, and how Gary V's Crush It encouraged him to change his business going forward. Um, also, we talked about the questions he asks his clients to get a deeper understanding about their dreams and goals perfect if you're running a studio and want to get deeper into the minds of your clients it's a great it's a great skill to have um, and also if that can affect the amount you can charge your clients um, talked about if he spends money on ads how he structures his days into three parts um, and so much more I think you'll love this interview with Nicholas uh, but before we get into this I want to tell you about a free guide you can download right now. It's called Three Tested Ways to Increase Your Client Base. And I made this guide for people who either have a home studio or work in a professional studio and want to increase their client base. Uh, the technical skills are already up to par and you have already spent your whole life making music, but the only thing that's missing is the clients. Or if you have finished your college degree and are looking to get your foot in the door in a recording studio. And the benefits of reading this guide is you will learn how to contact bands online, how to build profitable relationships, how to make clients coming back for more, how to price yourself, how to get your foot in the door, uh, and many more awesome things. So check this free guide out by using the link below in the description. Uh, I think you'll love it and find it very useful. But now over to Nicolas D. Lorenzo. So first of all, welcome to the podcast. Awesome to have you on. Thank you, mate. It's a pleasure. So before we get into all the fun stuff about your studio, Panorama Mastering, uh, and how you run your business and all those sort of things, um, it would be nice to hear how you got started in music. You know, if you can take us back to a young Nicholas playing an instrument, perhaps. Yeah, definitely playing an instrument, um, playing a piano. We had an upright in the house, so as soon as I could, you know, figure out how to open it up, I was smashing the keys on it, and that's where it all sort of started, and that went into getting lessons and learning and doing exams and building that side of it up in my childhood, and then slowly migrating into playing drums and then when you're playing drums, you're in bands, and then when you're in bands, you've got MySpace, and when you've got MySpace, you've got music plays, and when there's music plays, you've got Audacity, and you've, I was recording my my band's first stuff on a SingStar microphone. <laughs> That's funny, man. Because um, I also used to use Audacity. It was, I used to record like drums on a MIDI keyboard or something yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. That that and I think it's a guitar guitar pro. What was it? You know the tablature oh, yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those two. You know, I used to have a friend 
who me and my friends used to send recordings to from or recordings, I don't know, Guitar Pro files, begging yeah. him to listen to it, but he always deleted them. <laughs> nice. They're funny. <laughs> they're, I remember that. It was just good fun. Yeah, man. I mean, you actually learned a lot of nice music theory from using Guitar Pro, like note values and all those sort of things. Yeah, uh, it's it's a different way of looking at music, because especially on piano, everything's um, notated in a traditional manner, not numbers and strings. So it was really interesting to look at like chord structures in, in that respect, which is like complete 360 to, to how, how I was used to looking at music. So it was, it was, it was a fun little experience. Yeah, exactly. When I was man. younger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what kind of band were you in? Rock. Had to be rock. Yeah, of course, man. Who who was the inspiration? Uh, Guns N' Roses, um, Metallica. Iron Maiden was huge. Like, just a huge sort of, like, slew of those sort of bands. And, yeah, you just sort of... You just sort of go crazy on it because you're thinking you're going to be the next fucking rock star. But then you realize the heyday of that was like two decades ago, three decades ago. But so were any of your parents involved in music or how did you find it? Uh, the piano was a family piano. So my mum took lessons when she was younger and that piano came with her when, when she got married and moved out. And so no, no, none of, neither of them are super musically inclined or working in the industry, so to speak. Um, but mum had had lessons and that was, that was sort of like the little, little passage into it. Hmm. That's cool, man. Uh, and your dad, what did, what does he do or did? Um, uh, project manager at IBM. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's cool, man. <laughs> so, so really different, really different sort of style. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and did you ever study music like in high school, whatever you call it? What do you call it in Australia? Do you call it high school? Yeah, high school, high school. Um, yeah, I did. I did. And it was, it was actually pretty, a pretty valuable experience because I, I went to school i went to a private school and the 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 pedigree and and how hard they were on the students was probably a good it's something i didn't even appreciate at the time but something now that i look back on and i go wow um my musicianship and my the depth of knowledge i gained from having teachers and tutors and people on your back 24 7 it, it was insane like it, it was in, it was incredible. I, I really appreciate it, and, it, and it got me good opportunities as well because the school's music program. I got to um, travel into state on three occasions and perform with um, uh, be- perform with other jazz at uh, jazz Stedfords and other big bands. And I even had an opportunity to play with the um, play drums with the uh, National Army Band, the Duntroon National Army Band on their army base. Wow. That's cool, man. So for a sixteen-year-old, that's exciting. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, was it was it a jazz school you said, or a jazz focused? Uh, the music program was more more jazz and big band orientated. There, so yeah, it was it was it was very interesting, and, and and as I said, that that the fact that they were pushing us so hard, you know, I don't think, you know, it's it's it was necessary at the time, but. You know, the amount of depth of knowledge I have on just simple things like vo- voicing in chords, articulation, um, in, in terms of rhythm and polyrhythms and, and, and phrasing and whatnot. Like when I'm mixing a record and I hear little little um, like percussive lines or, or counter melodies or, you know, harmonies and things like that, I, I'm really able to interpret it and um, in, in a very musical way rather than it just being a sound that I'm trying to piece into this sort of fucking DAW in, instead of being so technical I've, I've got an appreciation for the for the musicality behind it which I'm you know I'm pretty grateful for but so if you if you do get something that is you know rich in in um, um, maybe odd time signatures or chord changes how do you think about that when you when you get to work on it as an engineer? I, I think of it as, as the same as anything, like a normal 4-4-4 four, four, four chord um, progression. The, the, the way I like to, to break it up is um, in in pitch, time, and texture. 
So, you know, pitch is obviously pitch, the register and instruments playing, the voicing it's playing, um, timing is the rhythm it's playing and what's, what's either competing with it, playing in unison with it or playing in counter to it. Um, and then in texture, that, that, that's the tone of the instrument, the, the articulation, the way it's played, how hard it's played, how soft it's played, how staccato or not. And, and, and with those three things of being conscious of pitch, time and tone, um, I'm, I'm able to consciously make decisions in the mix which, which represent the best values of the music. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's slightly different. I don't care if it's in 7-4 in, in or 6-8 or 4-4 four, four or, you know, if people are going to do some crazy shit like I've had some prog stuff come in and it's, it's, there's a hundred time signatures in it. But it's, it's, it's purely about those three things, pitch, time and texture or yeah. tone. That's interesting, man. Um, but so studying at that school, how did you get into recording uh, recording or yeah, eventually mastering? How was, what was that journey? So, so the recording side of things was simply, as I said at the start, you know, you have a band, you have songs, you have MySpace, how the fuck do you get them on there? You know, just figuring that out. And what do you, what did everybody have in the, in, in, you know, around PlayStation 2 time, everybody had a SingStar mic that was like dusty as hell because people played the game the first day they got them and then left it in the cupboard. Um, so, so that's how I started. And then eventually from that, it grew into like a Yamaha 10 track. Um, and then developed that and then developed on that. And then when I finished high school, I studied music industry at RMIT, which was an academic course. It wasn't focused around recording. And then I'm like, I want to be a recording engineer. I want to be a recording engineer. I go out, start my internship, you know, with all this knowledge, with all this energy, and then realize, you know, recording for yourself is one thing, but actually doing it as a gig for other people is really fucking a new ball game, and it wasn't for me. I was shit at it in that respect. So at that point, I sort of like, you know, cut ties with it, and I said, you know, I'm going to get back into this music industry, but I'll do anything. You know, I'll do PR, I'll do, I'll do fucking promoting, booking, events management, anything. I just want to be in the industry. And I ended up getting an assistant position at a mastering studio by chance. And then the rest is history. Uh, but so what was the experience at the recording studio then? Why didn't you find it to be suited for you? So, so when I was recording for myself or my band, I knew the material, number one. Um, I had autonomy and agency over how we did things and how we recorded things and how we put things together. And also musically, when we were dabbling on lines or changing things, I had that agency to, to make those decisions with the people around me. When it came to interning and working on other people's records, you're on their time, you're at their pace, you're at their sort of, you know, however they need you, you need to manipulate yourself to fit the situation. And, in the studio, I just wasn't cut for that. I just didn't have the personality to match that because I'm much more, you know, I'm a very pragmatic person. Like, we need to do this, we do this, we move on. Musicians and creatives, for the most part, aren't really like that. They're, they're, they're quite, you know, not airy-fairy, but they're quite fluid in their, in their train of thought. So, you know, I'd have a vocal booth ready to go and the vocalist wouldn't even be warmed up for it. So then I'd be like, fuck, what, what do I have to do? And I'd have to quickly mic up some guitar amps and have them ready to go so, so at least the guitars could get tracking because we've got two days to record an EP and they don't have budget for anything more. So it's like, you, you have to be fluid like that. And I just wasn't, I'm not cut out for that. Right. And how, how did you feel about the, the long hours of being in, in a recording studio? Did that ever affect you? I, 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 I sort of started towards the end of it to realize that it wasn't a feasible thing for me. Like, if if you own the recording studio, if you're on a salary, if you're an assistant getting a cut, or if you're a producer who's going to get back end on something, it begins to make a bit more sense. But sort of coming up, having finished uni, trying to go out on my own to spend 12, 13, 14 hours a day in a studio... And after you get paid a comps down to like ten, fifteen dollars an hour as an intern or an assistant, it the numbers didn't make sense. Like it just it just it was like, no, I, I 
if, if, if it was maybe three, four years ago while I was still at school, still at uni, I didn't have the same responsibilities, maybe different, but yeah, it just, it just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't make that work for me. Right. It makes sense, man. I mean, for me also realizing how long the hours are in a recording studio, you know, it makes you question, well, one, does it, does it need to be, do you need to work all these hours every day to make it work? That's always been my question. It seems a lot of things are fear based. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Uh, <clears throat> so you moved on from the recording studio and you got an internship at a mastering studio. Um, yep. So tell us about how did you get into the, the mastering studio? How did you connect with that guy? So I had been at another mastering studio before that main position. And I sort of had that in my resume. I hit up a hundred million people, you know, not just mastering students, but everybody. And this particular um, engineer hit me back and it was, just, it was just a chance opportunity. I just, right time, right place, right email. Yeah, that's how it worked out. So what do you write in that email to make him be like, yeah, come to my studio. I have a spot for you. Oh. It was just bullshit. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I've said it a million times, but I, I hate reading those emails because you you start to grow a level of maturity as you as you as you as you keep on in this industry, and and those emails were just like, hey, I've, I I would love to work at your studio or your place or your label or your this because I can do this this and it was just a whole bunch of bullshit, and that's why I probably had to send out. 150 200 just to get one back and in hindsight it's like what i wrote in my emails is the exact thing i look out for to not engage with if that makes sense like if somebody sends me an email that reminds me of my original email i'm like no nah, i do not want to hit this person up because i don't because because i haven't put enough thought effort and, and care into it right so how, how in your point of view do you put care and attention in an email what what do you what do you recommend including, so to speak. Just be real. Just as simple as that. I'd rather somebody email me going, I don't know what the fuck I want to do. However, you know, I'd like to sit in on a mastering session just to see how it goes about and if it's for me. And I'd prefer that over somebody coming to me and going, oh, I love mastering. I, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to do so much for you, X, Y, Z. And then I click in their resume or go on their links or check their portfolio. And it's like, all film scoring work they've done for the past five years. Mm -hmm. It was like, that, that doesn't make sense. No, exactly. Why is, how's mastering your passion and you spent the last five years doing film scoring? Like, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true, man. So yeah, you got to keep it relevant, I guess. Um, yeah, just honest and real. And, you know, you, you get a lot more appreciation on the back end of that. Mm. Yeah, exactly, man. Um, so... <clears throat> In, in when you did do the internship, how come you left it to start your own? Uh, was that always the plan or was that circumstantial? It was more circumstantial. Towards the end of it, I was starting to do more assisting work for them. Um, so I was like cutting tape, as in transferring tapes, cutting the final records in terms of topping and tailing and getting it all formatted and exporting, making notes in the session, doing small editing work on the mixes. Um, I was getting to that point and I'd been there for around 18 months or so. And at that point it was sort of like, okay, you know, it's, it's two years since I finished my course. I'm sort of in the back end of this. Um, there wasn't any sort of employment opportunity because that original studio had moved from being in the city to being at the engineer's house where he built a new studio. So it wasn't a multi-space facility anymore. So there was no room for other engineers. And if there was, it was just assisting work, which would be, you know, picking up scraps of work on the side. So it's sort of like I had to, I had to do something for myself because on the side of, or in parallel of running as an assistant, I was building up my own freelance work. So to have people coming into my bedroom, you know, sitting on the bed while I'm fucking mixing their records that they did at home or mastering their stuff. And so that was running in parallel with the system. It's like, well, it was almost 
every second day somebody was coming into the house, into my bedroom to mix a record, and consistently. So I'm like, okay, I've got something here. Um, I can't stay at the system position. I can't keep doing this in my bedroom. I've got to figure out something for myself. So, you know, I was fortunate. You know, my parents had a space for me that I could use, and they gave me the space, and I built in it, and I built a room in a room. I, I, I got a purposely built, well-treated, and, um, you know, doubled down and put a big fucking bunch of money to, to get started. Um, so how, how did you land your first client as a free freelancer? My first client as a freelancer was just somebody I was playing with in bands at school. Yeah, it was just because I played with them in the past, so they naturally knew what I was doing, they could see what I had done, and then that sort of translated into them, you know, coming to me to mix their record, and I think at one point I was in their garage helping them record the record as well. Um, yeah, and it was just, just natural like that, and then then they then the people they played with heard about it, and then they did more with me, and then, you know, while I was at uni, obviously I had contacts and a network, and, you know, they saw what I was doing, and then they would get on board, and yeah. Yeah, that's cool, man. Uh, so tell me about Panorama Mastering. How did you come up with the name, first of all? What does the name mean to you? Oh, man, the name was just something I plucked out of thin air because this this is this is something. What well, originally was Counterpoint Mastering, it was never released as Counterpoint Mastering, but in the business plans it was. Um, and I just didn't like the name because counter like is almost like something of a negative connotation with it. So I went with Panorama, a friend said it, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Because at the at the time, I was so adamant on having a studio brand. And it's taken me five years, five and a half years, and it served me well because people now know the brand, they know the studio, they associate it with me. But in hindsight, if I knew then what I know now, I would never have branded the studio. Right. What would, what would you call it instead? Just your name? Or? It just would have been just would have been my name, right. because right people want people more than ever now. There are so many brands. There are so many different fucking the, the the whole everything people engage with on social media on their phone on their you know on their Facebook, Twitter, Instagram is all branding, is all marketing, is all sell sell sell. And I try, in in my interactions on my social media with my brand, I try and get away from that as much as possible. But having that name associated still sort of aligns me as a brand that could potentially be selling with somebody something. Right now, people want people. That's all they want. They just want people. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, to be honest. And that's a great tip to know, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's a great skill yeah. to know, basically. Um But so take us through those, maybe the first year, first two years of your studio. How was it to open it up, get clients, come in? What was that process for you like? It was a delusional process. Like, so I, I as I said, I put a sizable amount of my own money into building it up. And at the end of it, I'm like, cool. I got the studio, I got the space, I got the pictures, I've got the brand, I've got all the fucking shit everybody else has, yeah? So then I kick back and I'm like, people are going to come, people are going to come, everything's good, everything's good, everything's great. And, you know, the first two years just returned fuck all. Like I was probably on minimum wage for it. And it was like, okay, you know, I, I needed a big fucking wake up call and I can't remember what sort of caused it, but I ended up I ended up starting to read Gary V's Crush It, and things started to click in my head. And then when they started to click, I started to put things into action. I started to actually fucking give a fuck about building myself up and building things that were valuable rather than just fucking resting on, you know, image, so to speak. And, and things spiraled into into something really really good from there but the first two years was just um was delusion was like and I think a lot of people uh, uh, um, are a victim to that though like even me now I'll do something 
and at the time will feel like the best, the greatest thing, and I'm fucking killing it. And then three, four months later, I get an opportunity to sort of re- reassess and look at it, and I go, oh, you know, I could have done this better, I could have done that better. Was that really as good as I thought it was? Um, I think self-awareness is a good word in this respect. Um, yeah, it's just, just something that didn't really click at the time. Right. So what was it in Gary V's book, Crush It, that made you realize, shit, I got to, you know, get this act together, so to speak? Well, it was, it was more just sort of all the lost opportunity I had. You know, there, there, was, there, was, there was so much I felt. As I said, I branded the studio with a name. So with that name, I always felt like I had to be like some fucking Microsoft or Apple communications. Like, this is this X, Y, Z. We have this, da, 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 like very corporate and robotic. And then after reading Gary V's one, it's like, hey, you know, you can talk about the shit you like. You can talk about how you're going about doing a record and, you know, give people insight, give people value, share people, uh, give people a story to follow. And it started to click and make sense. And it's like, well, it doesn't cost me anything extra to do that because I'm already doing it. It's just a matter of picking up my phone and taking a photo or writing something that happened in the day or journaling. And it translates really well in that respect. Um, So you starting to uh, sharing your story a bit more with people, did that increase your client base, so to speak? Hugely, hugely, because they built a huge trust factor. No longer was I one of those brands that were just one of the many hundreds or thousands of brands that were trying to market and capture and capture um, and capture sales. I was actually somebody who they could put a name and face and personality and associate some sort of intelligence to. Like Nicholas knows X Y Z. I know he's good for this. That's very cool, man. Um... And it also makes a lot of sense, to be honest. I mean, I've never thought about that myself, but I've heard other people talk about it too, you know. Um, But did you specifically go out, or go out is the wrong term, but did you specifically try to add value in in the groups on Facebook, for example, or did you have a plan like that in mind? Uh, I did, at some points, I was like, okay, I'm going to try this and I'd go and do this. So I'd go on the, on the Facebook groups or I would do YouTube videos or I would, I still do all this stuff, but it was just sort of like trial and error. It was like, okay, how do these platforms work? How do people interact on them? How can I help people or share my knowledge, my story, my personality with people in a almost passive and natural way to the way people were already operating on those platforms. That's cool. So, um, because I know you also had your Facebook group Panorama Mastering, or do you still have it? I still have it. I I, I re really sort of jigged it to 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 get back up. Maybe last month I started back on it. Ah, cool. Yeah, I know that yeah. was a great group actually. Uh, I haven't seen it being active for some time, but yeah, that's cool to know. Yeah, um, I think Facebook has started to restrict groups as well, which oh, is really? a little bit annoying. Yeah, in their reach. Oh, shit. So if you search for a group, it doesn't appear or? No, it does. But in terms of, you know how like you post something on a page and then it's got a limited amount of reach? Right. This the, that, That's happening more and more with groups. I think it's less about the reach, but more about the relevance. So Facebook sort of becomes an echo chamber. So if you're always searching about analog gear, all you're going to see are posts about analog gear. If all you're searching is about mixing, all you're going to see is shit about mixing. And my group for me, or the group which I run, you know, for people who are engaging in it, um, is more about the the shit people don't talk about on purpose. Because, you know, nobody really talks about, you know, mental health or empathy or self-awareness or, you know, motive, you know, that sort of stuff in the industry so that's the sort of shit I've been posting in there. So unless it's something you're consciously already searching and engaging with, Facebook won't really put it in your feed because if they put it in your feed and you don't find it interesting, it's too much of a risk that you'll click out of the site and lose them ad revenue. Right. Yeah, that's, that's the whole point of Facebook, why you can never be relied upon 100%, I guess. 
Yeah, no, I, 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 I think everybody should be on there. Everybody should be on every single platform. But never, ever, 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 ever rely on any of them. No, exactly, man. Um, but so you mentioned uh, men mental health and, and stuff like that. So why is that important for you to talk about? Because it's something that I, I, I'm me mentally, I'm very healthy. Like I, I've never went through any depression. I've never went through any of the shit that some people have to go through, which really fucking, you know, can can sometimes kill people, but, but more to the point, cause people a lot of pain, cause a lot of people a lot of hardship. And I think it's just, you know, people only want to talk about that's like talk about mental health, talk about their well being after a tragedy. It takes a celebrity fucking committing suicide or dying or overdosing for people to start posting on their socials about, you know, helping one another. And it's like, well, wait a second. This is mental health is something that you have to experience every single day. We're all humans. We all have emotions. We're not robots. And yes, it does affect the way you work. It doesn't impact the, the, your output. It does impact your success, so to speak. So why not have candid conversations and, and put information out there or share experiences openly? Yeah, exactly, man. Uh, I mean, especially in the, in the music industry where there's so many yeah. people feeling certain ways and people overworking themselves. Um, it should be talked about more, I, I think. 100%. Um, so let's get back to your studio and the process of you, you know, developing it and growing your business, so to speak. Um, so after those two years, after crushing it, <laughs> um, well, what did you see happen to your studio? It was just sort of like, you know, like a snowball. You built a bit of momentum and it's like a drug. It's like, okay, fuck, this feels good. You know, like I shared this bunch of stuff. People engage with it. People came to me for work. It's like, okay, I'm going to do more of it. So basically what happened was the more I shared my experiences, the more work would come in. And the more work would come in would multiply the amount of experiences I was having in my studio because I'm working on more projects. So then in return, I'd share more of those experiences because I had more project, more input, which meant I had more output. And then that would carry in more input and just sort of kept going around in that sort of circle, which is, you know, it, it, it's awesome to see happen. Now, now I'm sort of at a point where I sort of filter out the output because otherwise I'll just be bombarding people with shit 24 seven. Um, but still, I keep a high level of output from what I'm getting in, and it just sort of moves around. I mean, because something I notice, because I follow you on social media, is, I mean, first of all, you don't really talk about gear, which I enjoy, because uh, gear is really not relevant anymore. Um, but I love this. I, what I love about your post is um, you share the value, the value you create for your clients, for example, you know, how you are able to get deeper into what the project means to them, uh, and all that sort of things. Um, so first of all, how did you, how do you get into the brain or the, how your clients think about their music? How do you, what questions do you ask them? I asked them many questions that actually, that sort of theme that you're seeing stems from the purpose I create for myself. So there's this really good book by Marty Numa um, called Zag, you know, and it's a branding book and it, and it talks about positioning yourself and whatnot and, and finding a purpose or, or clearly differentiating, your, differentiating yourself from the market. And, you know, everybody's a mixing engineer these days. Everybody's a mastering engineer. You know, why do I really love music? Why do I really want to get involved in it? And it's like, well, for me, music is about a listener more than anything and creating that impact for a listener. So that's my purpose. That, that's where it stems from. And I'll get onto your sec your actual question in a moment, but I just wanted to set some pretense there. So everything I'm doing in my studio, all my experiences are framed around the idea that somebody's coming in with music and they want it to go out to listeners and impact them. So that's the sort of journey I'm taking. Music in, process, impact on listener. 
the sort of questions I ask them, I ask them a million questions because it's it's not it's not necessarily send me or mix, send me or stems, and I'll work on them, send them back, and then we're done. It's it's more to the point of how can we respect this music as something tangible and that can create an experience for somebody. So, who are you trying to make this music for, and what are you trying to communicate in this music, and how are you trying to communicate it? You know, why is this music going to be important to somebody? And these are questions so many artists don't think about. It's not to say that they don't care about them. They surely do because that's, you know, very integral for this, you know, how, how they continue on in their music career. But they haven't thought about them up until the point I'm asking them unless they've worked with me in the past. And I'll ask them these questions and we'll, we'll develop this sort of vision or this, this, this purpose for the music and then from those questions, we'll get really romantical, subjective, fluffy answers. Okay? Things that you can't really, you know, I, I want people to feel happy. Okay, well, ha you know, there's no happy button on a mix. You know what I mean? There's no plugin. There's no happy dot VST. Um, so from them, we start to, we, we have these sort of subjective, romantical notions when we're answering these questions, and then we break it down into objective ones. So we got the romantic, we got the like, oh, this is who it's for, this is what we're trying to do, we we want to we want to solve world peace or whatever. I, I don't know, you know, like all the all these we, like you know out there answers. It's like, okay, well, you're trying to achieve this, but what inside the music to you is getting this point across, or what inside the music to you is going to help the listener dance to this record, or sing to this record, or hum the melody, you know, what aspects have you put in this production, or you, you've written, or you arranged that are going to achieve that, and then we can start going into those details, and building up a hierarchy of information, and go, okay, you know, this dance track is meant for the, the German house market, not the housing market, but like house music market, um, it's meant for that. So what do they love? They love they love really big kick drums and deep basses. Cool. Why do they like that? Because the kick drums make the move and the basses like fill up fill up the energy. So it's not necessarily about having a rhythmic bass, it's about having a bass that fucking just soaks like a sponge. And then you start to break it down into aspects like that, like a pop arrangement with a female vocalist, you know? What's, what's the real key here? Is it your vocal tone or is it the vocal melody? It's a vocal melody. So we can compromise the tone in order to make the vocal sit at the front so people sing along to it. And you, you know, you just... You, it's, it, it's sort of really exploring the purpose music plays for a listener, and that's what it is to me. So if anybody listening or, or following along, it's, it's less about sort of taking what I'm doing and copying it. It's more about finding what you do and then figuring a way to create that journey for, for for your clients. So so I know some producers who are insane at working with the vocalists rough and transforming that into a song. You know? So it could be, you know, that's that's your position. How do you do that? How do you go about that? But so how when you have that conversation with the artist, how does that or can you can you feel that there is a better connection between you and the artist, therefore you are going to get the project, so to speak, or is there other benefits? The ben the benefits are, are simply the fact that I, I know that I see them on eye to eye. Because what, what happens is there's sort of this thing engineers do that engineers feel like they know everything. Okay, they, they sort of sit on this high pedestal and their clients are feeding them stuff so they can do some sort of godly process and then feed it back down to the clients. And if the clients don't like it, it's not, it can never be the engineer's fault. It's always the client's fault. You know, you, you can sort you, you, you've, I know you've heard that narrative play out many times in forums and many times in discussions amongst other audio engineers where they sort of sit themselves on a pedestal and everything the artists do is wrong. By asking these questions, it pulls me off my high horse and elevates my clients so that way we're seeing eye to eye. You know, I'm helping to talk their language, they're helping me to talk my language, and, and we sort of get to, to, to connect the dots on an even playing field. And it just at the end of it, it just means that output, I, I'm closer to the project, I'm closer to understanding what they're after and what they need for something to achieve their goals. And to me, that's that's what's important. I don't I don't need to be held on a pedestal to fucking do that. Right. 
Yeah, that, that's su super good to know, man. Um, but do you have any questions you usually ask the artists that do you, you can share with us? Or is it a case by case basis? No, those were the questions. Most of it is contextual. So it's like, okay, who's, who's going to listen to this record? Why is it important to them? What are you trying to communicate with this record? How are you trying to communicate it? And where are people going to listen to it? And how are they going to listen to it? Right. Um, and is that in the case of you sending them these questions in an email or that just, that's just a progress throughout the conversation in the beginning? I won't send it through an email because that will sort of confuse people. Um, it'll be something where I'm in a conversation with somebody, either in Messenger or in a phone call, and I'll pull out the information that I need from it. Or we'll sit on a Skype session and I'll literally ask them the questions as I just said, as I just listed them out, or they'll be in the studio and we'll be going through the questions. Yeah, that, that's uh, super helpful to, to, to learn, man. Um, but so when an artist reaches out to you, is that usually through your website or is, can it be through a social media or any, what was the most common platform for you? Every platform at the moment. So my personal messenger, my Facebook, the studio pages, messenger, Instagram, text message, phone call, email. Um, what are other ones? Sometimes WhatsApp. Um, I said Instagram. Yeah, I think I said Instagram. But yeah, just every every contact point people come through, and you know that's cool. You know, it's just just it's it's part of the cost of doing business. I'm not going to be too and through the website, of course, and email. I'm not going to be too you know pretty about it. It's like you know if if it helps people get in contact with me, whatever. You know, I'm not going to complain. You know, that's not yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. And do you do you spend money on ads on social media to reach more people, or what's your philosophy on that? No, I don't. Um, my philosophy is is sort of a bullshit philosophy about it, simply because I haven't done it. I think you need to do something before you can have a very strong, strong, strong conviction about it. My current conviction is that people. And this is based on my experience being a user on the platforms. As a user, I don't click on ads. I find them desperate. However, I've never run an ad for my business. I've never put together the content for an ad. So I don't know how well or not well it would run. I just don't use them at the moment. Right. That makes sense, man. Um, but so just going back to you learning more about the, your client and their needs and dreams and stuff, how did you, how do you find that affecting the price you can charge or the price you can quote them? Well, it's, here's the thing. There's, there's sort of like three levels. There's, there's pe people who just sort of like, um, you send something off and you get something back. So, so all you all you're paying for is the process itself. You don't have any input whatsoever. Then you've got people who have a little bit more credibility, a little bit more years behind them, and you get a little bit of interaction. And then you've got really comprehensive thinking. By asking, it's, I mean, it's not by asking the questions, it's by my main purpose in my job role, being that I'm a critical thinker, I'm a comprehensive thinker. It allows me to reach a section of the market that needs and wants that and understands and values that. And that does allow me to charge much, much more than what I ever have. Um, and even market-wise, it's, it's, it's quite a, a high price I demand. However, it's not that I'm demanding it out of prestige or out of, you know, trying to sort of fucking suck the money dry out of the industry. It's purely out of the value I'm providing, you know, people aren't just getting access to a mix. They're getting access to developing, you know, something that will impact their listeners at the end. And, and for many artists, that's, that's really high value. People need that. So, I mean, so you say you also offer them some sort of, um, I don't want to call it brand development, but artist development is, is that sort of a part of the, the, the added value by working with you? I, I think we can say project development. Right. Yeah. 
Um, because because here's the thing. This this is what this is this is the this is the huge thing I find. People come in, and so many of them go, "I want a radio ready mix." Okay. You can't quantify a radio ready mix. They aren't like there isn't a checklist that you know unanimously black and white zeros and ones says this is radio ready off. You know what? So so you dig deeper and you go, well, okay, radio ready mix. What does that mean to you? Well, that means it has a punchy kick drum and good vocals. Okay, okay. Well, let's take a step back. The real reason why you want a radio ready mix is because you might want to be on the radio or you want people to engage with your music on a larger scale. You want to attract that audience, okay? All right. So, cool. Um, so, let, let, let's look into to, to how we attract that audience. Okay, what, what are you trying to do with your music? And then we go back into those questions I asked at the start. So, you know, we've got, our, we've got our umbrella goal, which is we want to reach a lot of people with our music or we want to impact the people who we do reach with our music so they come back to listen to it. Okay, so who are you? I, I'm, I'm XYZ artist or I'm, I don't know, um, Mac Daddy, I don't know, whatever name you want to, want to create for this, this artist. <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm, I'm this artist. Okay, cool. Um, why are people going to come back to listen to you? What's going to make you get return listeners and grow that fan base? Well, it's the fact that I spit huge, huge, huge um, lines. You know, I'm, I'm a great rapper. You know, okay, cool. So, so the rap is really important to this mix. Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, cool. So what are you rapping on? I'm rapping on, you know, some, you know, 90s styles, East Coast beats, you know, they're, they're really like that sort of tapey sort of, okay, cool. So radio ready for that person and making them connect with their listeners is completely different to the sort of radio ready you'd get from an electronic producer. And, and that's sort of how the conversation starts and then develops into actually something that we can build up as a mix or a master. Well, more, more so these conversations happen in mixing than mastering. They're still important for mastering because context is important especially in mastering when something has to go out into the real world. But more so in mixing, this 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 sort of demand is is, is of high value to, to clients. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense, man. And it's 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 fascinating how much you can you know not learn but how how much you can do with just asking the right right questions. Um, it's 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 a great skill to learn to be honest. And, and more so than asking the right questions about listening. Yeah, exactly. But did you say that that book, uh, SAG or SAG, whatever, however you pronounce it, was a, Zag. Good, yeah, was a good source to, to, to read if you want to get into this skill more? Oh, uh, no, not this book. This book was more about the purpose. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, sorry. So, so this, is, this is more about the underlying purpose of my brand. And that purpose has then sort of built up and fed how I liaise with my clients to develop this sort of thing. Um, in, term, in terms of building up that value, I, I don't I don't really know where I've soaked up the information from one particular space to learn that. I think it's more something that's come under developing myself and developing my brand and understanding my job role. Because it's like, okay, I think... 12 months ago, I really looked at like, what do my clients want? Everybody wants to be getting hundreds of thousands of streams on Spotify. You know, they really want to be impacting listeners. And it's like, well, I love music. I love the way music impacts me. And that's something, that's a language I speak. You know, that's something I have access to, which not many other engineers have access to. Because as you said, you know, so many engineers are focused on their gear, on their technique, on their making the punchiest kick drum or the biggest bass, but not necessarily the musicality, which is which is which is the new selling point of today's age. Because the the one thing that allows an artist to stand out now is their point of difference. You know, no longer are they at the at they at the mercy of being gatekept by having to submit tapes to a radio and hoping they get on it. Now they can go on distro kid pay, you know, I don't know how much it is, is it like 29 US or something for the year or something? I'm not sure. It's cheap. They can pay, you know, very little amount of money and have their music out to the whole world. So there's no more gatekeeping on what the sound is of today. It's purely about how you differentiate yourself so you can impact somebody that they come back. How, I'm very curious to know actually how you structure your day to you know, to still be able to learn, you know, develop your business 
side of things, but still being creative and do mastering for people. Um, so yeah, how do you structure your day or days? So my, my days are structured into three parts. I have three categories on my calendar, um, CEO, CFO, and doer. And it's a technique I learned from Ryan Serhart, who's a major real estate agent in New York City. He wrote a book on sort of how he goes through his sales cycle and developing how he's built up his business and empire over there. And anyway, those three categories, CEO, CFO, and doer, are the three categories which have to be filled out in my calendar. So CEO is chief executive officer. That's all my liaising with clients, doing stuff for the industry, liaising with the industry, building up brand awareness. That's basically the funnel in to people potentially working with me. CFO's chief financial officer. So that's all my admin, accounting, sending out invoices, any things I have to purchase or invest in or whatnot. That's the second category on my calendar. And the third one is doer. And that's actually when I'm actually out there doing tasks, setting up a job, um, mastering a record, mixing a record. And those three categories, as long as something fits into one of those three, I know that I'm doing something throughout my day that's moving me forward. If it doesn't fit into those three, it's, it's typically personal or because it's not valuable. Um, and the way I set that calendar up is every night I'll go through all my emails, all my messages, all my Instagram messages, all the places where people contact me, build up a big list of everybody I have to get back to, all the things I have to do, all the invoices, all the jobs I have to finish up. Then I'll open up my calendar app and after seeing all those things, I've tallied up general times to complete each of my tasks and I'll lay them all out into the calendar for the next day. Right. And then the doer or that that's part of the, the doer part or is that also the actual work like to for you to master that's also the doer i guess right yeah mastering is doer yeah yeah that's cool man and how has that benefited your your life to to take on that mentality rather than trying to be everywhere all the time because i know what i'm trying to achieve when i'm achieving it so if something's in my calendar under CEO, I know I'm purely creating brand awareness, liaising with clients, potentially bringing in business. And that's my goal when I'm doing that stuff. Um, if I'm doing CFO, I know I'm purely making, putting money out there or putting invoices out there for something to come back in. You know, if I'm doing dual work, I'm doing work that's earning me money. You know, that's the actual time I'm actually earning back on the other two. Yeah, so it allows you to organize, yeah, your day, basically, or weeks ahead. Um, cause that's something I've started doing as well, and it's, it's super helpful. Um, and yeah, I can also highly recommend it to people listening. And yeah, it works for you too. Um, so that's awesome. Um, and as, just talking about books here, because you mentioned that book just briefly in the other books before. Um, cause I know you, you, uh, you mentioned the uh, Benjamin Franklin's 13 virtues, you know, and how they influenced your life. Um, yep. so could you tell us how that, or what these, these 13 virtues are and how they have impacted you? So it's, it's more the practice of what he did rather than the actual virtues he held himself to, because I can't recall all the virtues, but basically he had this system where, where he would, he, he had a sort of grid set out in a booklet. And 13 virtues, which he held close to himself and that he held himself accountable to. And at the end of each day, if let's say one of the virtues may have been, may have been, I don't know, um, uh, cleanliness, you know, he wants to keep a clean space. He wants to keep a clean mind or whatever. And throughout that day, he didn't adhere to that virtue. He'd put a black mark in the box for that virtue. And then at the end of the week, you can see visually what has and hasn't. You, you can have a better, more objective look and a self-assessment about how you're conducting yourself in your day and throughout your, your life. And for me, I just, you know, developed that for myself last year where I, you know, listed, I think it was 13 or 14 different virtues which I wanted to hold, hold myself accountable to, which I felt were important 
to my own integrity. And you'd be very surprised at the end of the week, the stuff that you do that you let yourself get away with. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, what, what would some of those things be you would, you would um, not neglect, but miss, let's say? Um, I think humility was a huge one, or it's still a huge one. You know, I, I'm very, I'm much more conscious of it now than ever. But humility is one, because it's it's really easy to go and you know sort of gloat or you know go out there and you know be a little bit you know and rightly so proud. Um, but you you t- I tended to do it much more than I ever thought I was. And that's something I had to rein in. And was there anything else you found impactful? Um, the the most impactful thing was doing it over a long period of time. I could see my tally at the end of each week getting less and less, which means I was holding myself accountable more and more because I was more aware of those things. So I got my virtues up here because I can't remember them all list by list. But my ones were moderation, silence, resolution, doing only good, Working forward, sincerity, justice, cleanliness, acceptance, tranquility, tranquility, compassion, diligence, and modesty. And on my last tally, the ones which I found most in were modesty, diligence, working forward, and silence. Beyond doing these virtues and improving yourself, I know you also became a recent uh, father, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. How has that yeah. impacted you, your? view on life and running a mastering studio and all that? Uh, I, I still have the same motivation and drive with my studio and my business. Um, it sort of allows me to value my time much more because every, if, here's the, here's the difference. Like before my son came along, you know, my hustle was relatively flexible you know, with my timeline and my goals and like if I needed to do something tomorrow or if I wanted to set something up, I could do it next week. Whereas now, every single minute and second and millisecond I'm in the studio is a, is time I'm away from my home. So it's like right now, every second, I have to be fucking doing something. I have to be on it because otherwise I could, I could be at home with my, my son. Does that make sense? So it's like, I'm really, it, it really changes that there's no sort of um, complacency or, or sort of, you know, putting things off. Right. And yeah, it makes you more efficient, maybe, too? Makes me more efficient, yeah. Makes me more efficient. It, it, it Mentally, it makes me more efficient. Sometimes I'm more fatigued because of a lack of sleep um, sure. <laughs> than I'd like to be. But, yeah, um, yeah it, it makes you value the time that you're doing here much more. Like, you know, back in the day, it would be like, oh, oh somebody would might, might be paying an invoice late. You know, no worries. Do it when you have to. Now it's sort of like, dude, I just took two hours out of my day instead of spending time with my son. And I'm not going to wait because, you know, I, I, that, that, that two hours isn't free. You know what I mean? Like, that sort of that sort of mentality. It's, 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 and it's good because it allows you to highly, highly, highly value your time, which means whatever you're putting into that time has to be valuable itself. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that makes total sense, man. Um, yeah, because, you know, you don't want to work and miss all all the important stuff, I guess you, you can call it, you know. Yeah, and then even though even then when you are working, you're doing important stuff itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly, man. Like, yeah, no fucking around. Yeah, exactly. Um, I saw recently that you have this um, masterclass happening at Abbey Road Institute in Australia, right? Yeah, I do. That's in a few weeks' time now. Yeah. Could you tell us a bit maybe what you're going to talk about there? Perhaps there's some listeners from Australia who could check it out. Yeah. So the masterclass is going to be split into two different halves. The first half is mastering and Number one, my perspective on mastering, but two, more importantly, the landscape of the industry in terms of mastering. So people can, because because here's the reason why I'm, I'm focusing on number one, my perspective, and number two, the landscape of mastering is because a lot of people go into these things, they get this sort of general 101 on what a mastering engineer does, and they leave with no practical application. 
So for me, it's sort of like, okay, how how do I know the industry to be and how do I know people are engaging in mastering? Because not everybody's going to a mastering engineer and that's completely fine. And then giving people the tools and information they need so when they leave the masterclass, they can actually apply themselves practically rather than just having a bunch of notes or dot points from a, pres a presenter. The second half is about my story going from, because I finished my course, I finished my degree, how I went from there to actually having a studio. Uh, will, will you also make that available? Like, will you film it or record audio or will you share that experience with yeah, people around the internet? I've had a few people ask, so I'm considering, like now, now I think about the sixth or seventh person have asked me if I am. So I think I might have to but we'll see what time and resources permit. Right. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, did you also have something free coming out that would help people, um, like a guide or whatever you want to call it, that would help people um, charge uh, for projects or putting a proposal together? What was the thing? Okay, yeah, I announced it yesterday. Uh, it's not for free, um, right. unfortunately. I wish it could be. But um, it's so we were discussing how I communicate with my clients, mm -hmm. um, the questions that I ask people and whatnot. Um, this is a brief kit for building up mixing briefs and project briefs for your projects. And it's, 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 it's a kit that consists of a 30 page manual which details. The questions I ask and why I ask them and how I ask them, and then it's associated with another five work, four or five worksheets, which detail a framework that you can engage your clients with. So how you can put together a project order, which details your liability, your timeline, your costs involved, your resources needed, which they can actually physically sign off on, and it can be a legal sort of binding thing. It's got documents in there which build up the sonic identity of a project. You know, who's it for? What, what are you trying to communicate? How are they going to listen to it? Um, it's got sections in there which help you build out a hierarchy for a mix, listing, you know, what's the most important thing to the least important thing in the verse and the intro and the choruses. It's 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 pretty comprehensive and that's why um, I've associated, you know, a fiscal value with it. And I've also shown it, associated a fiscal value with it because more so... I have released free stuff in the past and it's reached many, many people and helped many, many people, which is really, really good. However, this information is, is slightly more at a higher level for people who are already in the industry, already mixing records or already aspiring to mix records. Um, so I don't want it to sort of just sit in people's download folder, you know, waiting until they clean out their trash and then going, fuck, where did that go? You know, I know if I associate a, a slight dollar value to it, that people will put the money down and really want to use it um, rather than letting it sit and go to the wayside. Yeah, exactly. And where can people uh, find this um, tool, so to speak? Or... I will be publishing it on my website tomorrow, which is Wednesday, the 24th of July. Yeah, cool. Um, I mean, I have a link in the description below. So when people listen to this, it should be available. So people check it out. Sounds great. Um, and just before we wrap up, uh, where can people find more info about you beyond this, this we just talked about? Yeah, fair enough. So panoramamastering.com.au is my webpage. So if you go there, you can learn a little bit more about what, what I do, but there's also a really cool section in there called knowledge. And in that knowledge tab is all the articles, all the podcasts, all the videos, all the events, all the re like free down uh, sample uh, preset packs I release, everything in there. And you can engage in a bunch of free content on many, many different topics with lots of fucking information and shit about the way I run my business and the way I operate in this industry and my advice to people who, you know, nice. might need it. Yeah, I'll put, the, cool, i put that in the link too so people can check it out. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for coming on to the podcast, man. It was awesome to have you and you share some great knowledge. So thanks. No worries, my pleasure, right? Thank you for having me on. Thank you very much for coming on to the podcast, Nicolas. It was awesome talking to you and I hope you, the listener, found it very useful too. 
Um, before you leave, please leave a comment and a rating below or in iTunes or wherever you're listening. And also, don't forget to download your free guide, Three Tested Ways to Increase Your Client Base, link also below. And I'll see you next week.